The discrete cosine transform is very similar to the more familiar discrete Fourier transform. In this video, we're going to look at why we might consider transforms other than the discrete Fourier transform, introduce the discrete cosine transform, and examine the role of the discrete cosine transform in MP3 coding of audio. In general, we can think of a transform as representing a signal x of n in terms of a weighted sum of basis signals or basis functions in linear algebra terms. So in this equation, the ck of n are the basis signals or basis functions, and the bk are the coefficients that are associated with each basis signal. Now in the discrete Fourier transform, the ck of n are complex sinusoids. So we have ck of n is e to the j 2 pi k over cap n times lowercase n, where cap n is the length of the signal. Now why are complex sinusoids useful? Well, the biggest reason is because of how they interact with linear time invariant systems. If we put a complex sinusoid with frequency k over n into a linear time invariant system having frequency response h of f hat, then the output of that system will be h of k over n times the input complex sinusoid. So the action of the system is to multiply the input complex sinusoid by the frequency response of the system at that frequency. So if we expand an arbitrary signal x of n as a weighted sum of complex sinusoids, and we put that into a linear time invariant system, then the output takes a particularly simple form. It takes the same form as the input, except the coefficients have been modified by the corresponding values of the frequency response. So the coefficients of the input signal were ck, and then the coefficients of the output signal associated with frequency k over n are h of k over n times ck. So the action of the system is one of multiplication on these coefficients that we use to represent the signal. This leads to the important notion of filtering, because we can think of filtering as a multiplication effect in the frequency domain. So if our goal is to interact with linear time invariant systems, then the discrete Fourier transform has some very significant advantages because of this conversion to multiplication at the output. However, if we're interested in other tasks, such as performing compression of a signal, then it's not necessarily the best choice. So the basic idea behind compression is that we're going to take our signal x of n and write it as a weighted sum of these basis signals again, which are known. Then we compress the signal by setting the bk that are insignificant to zero. In other words, if most of them are zero, all we have to do is store or transmit a few coefficients and we'll have all the information that was in x of n. Because a coefficient on the right-hand side, a bk equals zero, doesn't contribute at all to x of n. So if x of n has capital N values and only capital L of the bk are significant, then by saving the bks instead of the x of n, we reduce our storage requirements by a factor of capital N divided by L. If n is 1,000 and l is 10, we've reduced our storage requirement by a factor of 100. This is the basic idea that's used in JPEG, MP3, MPEG, and so on. It's to represent the signal in terms of a set of basis signals where there's a significant number of coefficients that are small. Then we save the significant coefficients and reconstruct our signal from those coefficients. So the discrete cosine transform plays a prominent role in these types of compression schemes. So I'm gonna write our signal x of n in terms of the discrete cosine transform as I've outlined here, the first term is associated with zero frequency, a cosine of zero frequency or a constant. So this is just a coefficient. And then we have a sum from k equals 1 to n minus 1, 
of a set of weights times cosines whose frequencies depend on k. So we can compare that to the expression at the top by noting that b0 is going to be 1 over n times xc of 0. So this is our coefficient associated with the c0 of n, which is exactly 1. And then for k greater than or equal to 1, we're going to have bk to be this weight that's out in front. So 1 over n, 2 times x superscript c of k. And our basis signals are these cosines whose frequency depends on k. Now, there's a fairly simple expression for finding the coefficients, the x sub c of k. And that is we just sum up the values of the time signal multiplied by a cosine of frequency k over n. And compared to the discrete Fourier transform, everything in these expressions is real valued. So these coefficients are real valued. One does not have to work with complex numbers. However, in contrast to the discrete Fourier transform, cosines don't share the same property that complex sinusoids do with respect to linear time invariant systems. If I apply a cosine of frequency f hat to a linear time invariant system, the output is not some factor multiplied times the cosine, but rather the output has the magnitude of the frequency response in front of the cosine. That multiplication is fine, but we have this phase factor that's inside the argument of the cosine. So I can't write the output as the product of something that depends on the system at that frequency times the input cosine. And this makes the discrete cosine transform much less useful when dealing with linear time invariant systems. But it's very useful when working with compression because of the fact that these coefficients are real. And for many signals of interest, using cosines is an efficient way to represent the signal. In other words, there's a fairly small number of BK that end up being significant when you choose the CK to be equal to cosines. MP3 format audio takes advantage of this property of the discrete cosine transform. And if we have an audio signal, the way we code it using MP3 is first to break it up into 26 millisecond blocks. And that leads to a capital N or a length for the signal of 1,152, assuming that we're working at 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate. And we take this 1,152 length signal, find the DCT coefficients, and then we look at those coefficients and we decide to only store the ones that are important. And we store those in terms of bits. Now, because we can generally discard many of the coefficients, this is a very efficient way of representing this block of signal. It turns out that when we say important, the MP3 algorithm decides how important a coefficient is based on human perception and the desired quality of the signal. There's some unique things about how humans hear audio that are taken advantage of to reduce the storage requirements. For example, if there are two sinusoids or tones that are very close together in frequency, typically the larger amplitude tone will mask or make the weaker amplitude tone impossible to hear. And so there's no need storing the information associated with that second tone because humans aren't going to perceive the difference. So once we've stored our signal in this MP3 format as a sequence of bits, then to play it back, we have to decode it. The decoding process is generally chosen to be simpler because it's done in real time. So in this case, we take these bits that have been encoded in the step when we apply the MP3 algorithm, and we extract the coefficients that were saved from that, and we'll call those x hat, because in general, they're not exactly equal to the coefficients that we got out of the original DCT, because we may choose to store some of these coefficients only approximately to further save the amount of storage that we require. 
Then we apply these approximate coefficients to the inverse discrete cosine transform to obtain an approximate representation for the original audio signal. By representing the signal using cosines of different frequencies, we don't have to work with complex numbers in this process. And furthermore, it turns out to be pretty efficient for audio to represent it using these cosines of different frequencies. And thus, MP3 can achieve pretty significant compression.